All right. Welcome, everyone, to the pilot track of Europython 2020. Uh, I, I hope you all had a good time uh, in the initial part of the conference, you know, where Mark introduced you to all the platforms and the first time we are having this online. So this is going to be the first track of the data science session, which is exciting, the pilot track. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you uh, to Tanya, who is joining us from the UK. Oh, hey. Oh, you can unmute yourself. Of course. Hello, everyone. Of course, my dog decided that it's the perfect time to start barking at whatever <laughs> she's barking now, because that's how it works. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for joining my talk. And I'm going to share my slides, if that's OK. Yeah, I I'm going to le let you go all day. Fantastic. And I think let's share it now. Oh, fabulous. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Tanya Lard, and I'm a senior develop de developer advocate at Microsoft. Um, this is where you can find me. You can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, and uh, on my personal site. I, I run a lot of projects, like side projects, uh, things like mentor sprints. I'm also starting a podcast for um, called Python 101, and I do a lot, 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 lot of stuff here and there. Um, after the talk, you're going to be able to find these slides at this URL. They're not yet available, but they're going to be made available soon after I finish the presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to put them on Discord. Um, and I, depending, well, I, I'll answer some questions right after my talk, and some others I'll just jump onto the chat myself. And I'm also going to be available later on at the Microsoft sponsor room. Uh, so we can carry on the conversation or talk about anything else um, that you're interested. And just to set expectations on what this presentation is going to cover, I'm just going to work out, uh, well, explain why you want to use Docker, especially in a data science and machine learning context. Um, because it can be a bit different to when you're developing web apps or other sort of applications with Python. Going to give you some tips on improving your security and performance um, when you're working with Docker and some ways in which you can actually automate your workflow so you don't have to start doing everything from scratch. And I'm going to finish up with a summary of tips and tricks and how to use Docker so you can start um, jumping straight into it. Um, so let's start with why do you want to use Docker? I am sure a few of you have been in this um, in this situation where you're developing an application. It can be anything, a model or a web app or an API that returns a, a prediction or, or something. So would you actually try to share this with somebody else if you are not sharing your environment? Um, as well as the specifications, you're going to see that your folks or your friends have actually encountered this problem. Either modules are not found or data or environment variables are not set. So if you're not sharing all of the required things that folks need to actually rerun or reproduce your uh, analysis or your app, then it, that's a massive blocker for them, really. Um, so Docker is actually an amazing tool that helps you to create, deploy, and run your applications using containers. And this gets rid of the problem of one hand, your laptop is not a production environment. So it allows you to mimic environments where you're going to actually be deploying your apps or your products that your customers use. And this is how throughout my presentation, I'm going to um, point to a container. Um, this is just a mental exercise. This is just like mental representation, but it will help us to understand where in the workflow a container fits. Um, so as I said, again, 
containers are a great way of solving the problem of your laptop is not a production environment. So it really, really allows you to get your software or your application or your model moved from one computing environment to another. So it can be um, your laptop, your test environment, your staging environment, and your production environment seamlessly and with all dependencies and requirements already bundled so that basically you can run it out of the box or out of the container. Um, so then when you're working with containers, not only do you are developing your application or your model, uh, but you're also bundling together all the libraries, dependencies, the runtime environment and configuration file. Uh, within a container so then folks can reproduce and reuse and build on your application in a seamless manner. Um, so if you're familiar with virtual machines, if you've ever used virtual machines to develop on a different platform or a different operating system, this uh, abstraction might sound a bit familiar. Um, but the nice thing about Docker and containers is that it actually operates at the app level. So you have your infrastructure, whatever your infrastructure is, if it's cloud, if it's local, if it's a HPC, and you have your host operating system, Docker sits on top of that, and you can have multiple apps containerized. So um, it takes a very little overhead and you can have multiple runtime environments, multiple containers running on the same infrastructure as an isolated process. The difference with the virtual machine is that all the abstraction happens at the hardware level. So instead you have your infrastructure, hypervisor, and then you have full guest operating system. So you can imagine that you'll have a full Windows system, operating system, full Linux, DVM, for example, a full Linux Ubuntu and uh, Red Hat, for example. But it's, it's very, very bloated because uh, it includes all of the native packages and all of the native dependencies that said operating system needs to, to operate. Oh, I'm going backwards. Bear with me. Um, so that makes it much, much um, bloated than an actual container because you'll also have the binaries. Now, when you talk, if you're not very familiar with the lingo of container and images, uh, sometimes you're gonna go read tutorials and this happened to me at the very beginning when it was just getting started. Um, and there are so many words that are thrown in. So for example, um, let's start with image, which is an archive with all the data needed to run the app. So basically that's just an snapshot of all the libraries, dependencies, um, uh, every, and the code, for example, that you need. Um, you then have uh, a tag, as you would normally do with your software when it's in version control and you make a new release every time you update, for example, the binaries or the libraries, uh, you make a tag. And then you can pull that image um, from repositories like Docker Hub, for example, and you then run it you run that image. And every time you run that image, it's gonna create a container. And that's actually when you can create, where you can create your development work, where you can do your work. Um, and depend, you can mount volumes, you can persist some data, but it all spins from the Docker image. You can actually have multiple containers spin out from the same image. Um, now, again, if you've tried to learn how to Use Docker, more than likely you've gone to your uh, web search engine and you've typed Python and Docker tutorial and you're going to find out that most, um, that most folks have actually developed tutorials based on web data uh, or sorry, web applications. But they're not exactly the same when we're doing data science and machine learning. Uh, we can have a lot of complex setups and dependencies, especially if you work with things um, like Arrow or TensorFlow or Kubeflow or things of the such. Those dependencies can be very complex and, and getting things right can sometimes uh, take a long time. We also have high reliance on data. We have data ingress and egress all the time. Uh, and we even work with data that are not public, publicly accessible or sensitive. So making sure that our development environment, our security is critical. And 
We also work, especially when you're in the iterative research development process of developing either a new model or an algorithm or application, that, that process is very, very fast evolving. So sometimes you're installing dependencies just to try something on, it doesn't work, then you try another dependency and such. And getting things right in, in Docker and orchestrating containers can take a lot of time. It can be a bit complex um, when, when we're working with them. So how is it different from more apps, for example? Um, we all know that our Python packaging ecosystem is a bit um, complex to say the least. So sometimes we want to understand where, it, um, or we want to find ways where it is good enough to start packaging. Uh, we have very, very complex dependencies. For example, like um, if you have um, a team where some folks are working Python and some others are working with R and some others are Julia, where do you draw the line on, we need Blas, we need R, we need Julia, we need all of these dependencies, we need to optimize uh, builds for this. Um, it is very, very hard sometimes to console and, and get robust and also lightweight containers uh, for data science works. And also, in our case, not every deliverable is an app. Not all of the, not all of the things that you do with machine learning or all of the products that you're doing with machine learning is going to end up as an app or as an API. We have multiple types of deliverables. And also, there's a lot of uh, real emphasis out there saying that machine learning equals model. And that is not the true either. Not every deliverable is a, mo is a model. As I said before, also, uh, we rely on data. Data is our, our gold, is our primary um, material. So we, we deal with this in, in many, many ways. Um, also, because again, how our scientific Python ecosystem works, um, we're gonna have a mixture of wheels, a mixture of compiled packages that we're gonna need. Uh, probably we're gonna have Conda, some other folks are gonna be using things like Poetry and Pipem. Um, and, and we have a lot of different channels as well if you're using Conda. And as well, if you're working in a multidisciplinary team or you're working across multiple uh, projects in machine learning, people are going to have and going to need different security access levels for both data and software. Um, for example, if you're working with highly confidential data, you might just want to block um, internet egress from your container, but other folks are probably working with public data sets and they don't need that. Um, that such high security access levels. So again, how do you reconcile all of, all of these apparently confounding requirements? It can be very, very tricky. And finally, um, especially when you're working to, to create products at, uh, based on machine learning, you have a lot of folks that use Python and use data in a very different way. So you have folks uh, in the data science team, software engineers, so in some other teams might have machine learning engineers that take care of um, taking your machine learning deliverables into production um, or out there in the world. So um, again, I, I, when I was learning to use Docker, I experienced a lot of frustration. Um, because I would, I would go and say, hey, well, go and search, how do I do a Docker or build a Docker image for Python? And this is like what I would find everywhere, um, which is a bad example. And I'm going to be telling you why this is a bad example. Um, but you start every time you start with a Docker file and it's a specification file where you're providing basically a set of instructions on what software to install, what and how to configure your image. Um, so you start from normally uh, a base image that is gonna define what operating system or what kernel you're gonna be working on. And 
In this case, we normally want to use something starting with Python, then to provide the main instru instructions. And if you're familiar with Bash, um, it's very, very similar. It's the same syntax. It is the same kind. It's the same kind of uh, instructions that you would go and an entry command. Now you have to be very careful because everything like stacks on top of each other. So Docker, like all of Docker images is creating a layer. So you can imagine that if you follow traditional workflows, you're going to end up with a very, very big and blocked image. Um, so how do you even choose the base based image? Well, it depends a lot on the requirements. Um, a lot of folks and a lot of tutorials out there tells you to, to use Alpine because it's very lightweight. It doesn't have a lot of um, unnecessary binaries. Don't do it. It's an absolute pain to get anything working. Um, so if you're going to need to build from scratch, use official Python images. And I recommend using the slim version that it's like, as the name says, slimmer, it's thinner. Um, but I would recommend using also either the variant of Buster uh, for 3.7 and 3.8. Um, I can talk more about that in detail, but if you need to build everything from scratch, use those. If you don't need to build anything from scratch, uh, and I absolutely recommend this for most of the case, just go to the Jupyter Docker stacks. The folks there have done an amazing job trying to understand what are the um, traditional or most common requirements that data scientists have, and they've already pre-baked a lot of um, Docker images for you. If you've ever used things like Binder or Repo to Docker, again, this, this is a very similar stack, and that saves you a lot of time, a lot of fiddling, and a lot of headaches. So next, we've identified our base image. What do we do next? Um, you always have to know what you're expecting. If you remember in the first example, it just says Python 3. We need to know again the specific tags so we always uh, know what we're pulling, avoid using things like LaTeX, provide context with, la uh, with labels, especially if you're sharing this. Um, and something that a lot of folks forget and a lot of tutorials don't tell me about is adding a security context. Um, because this will allow your, your Docker container to be much more secure. And you can start using tools like Snake for, for, um, for a vulnerabilities assessment. Um, if you need to run very complex statements, um, split them and sort them. And as a general thumb of role, you have um, copy statements and add statements, I always prefer copy because um, it's a much better way to do it. Um, again, also make sure to use the cache um, because whenever you're building your images and you change something within your software, um, depending on where you put that, uh, like this copy, um, the run statements, everything is going to rebuild. So try to lever leverage this build cache. Normally, install, install the requirements first, unless you're up updating your libraries. Um, do a clean of, of, your, um, of your installs, either using Conda or Pip, so you, your image is not bloated. And then separate your instructions for, for scope. This, this ensures that your cache is hit um, as appropriate as possible. Again, only install what you need and concrete versions of everything. And something that we forget a lot when working with data is explicitly ignore files. If you're familiar with GitHub uh, or with, sorry, with Git or version control, you might remember a Git ignore file. We can have something similar for Docker that is called Docker ignore, and it follows the same process where you can um, deny or add a certain number, certain files or certain directories that so they actually are not passed directly onto your Docker file or used into uh, your container. Um, this is especially good for um, when you have settings or environment variables or super, super secret keys that you don't want to go out there. Um, to access data, there are lots of ways to do it, and it depends on where your data lives. 
Um, if you are using local data, bind mounts, um, create mounts to directories instead of moving the data over because you always want to have your data up to date instead of baking them into the, in baking it into the container and also create a non root user um, because and, and this takes us directly to security and performance by default docker allows you to do everything that a root user does um, but you don't want that. You don't want to introduce vulnerabilities. You want to privilege, uh, to favor the least privileged user. So if you go, for example, to any of the Docker science, uh, data science stacks from the Jupyter stack or the repo to Docker one, you're going to see that we're creating, uh, that they create uh, a non privileged user called Jovian, for example. And um, that's where all of the work is going to take place. And that allows, a, that allows your container to be locked down. That means that folks are not going to have access to the kernel, are not going to be able to do different um, potentially damaging actions, and you're minimizing capabilities. Um, also, it's going to prevent a lot of issues. I don't know if you've ever been working in a container or something. Um, and then it tell when you're trying to work, uh, it tells you you get an error saying that you don't have access to a certain directory or a, you can't mount the volumes. Normally, it is because there is an inc um, no, a non compatibility between uh, root user privileges and whichever user you are trying to work on top of the container. Um, and having this Titan is very, very essential, especially if you have the security access level uh, restrictions, if you are working with confidential data. Um, again, I said that all of the Docker containers are like onions, so everything is contained in different layers. Um, sometimes you think, oh, well, if I copy this key in a layer and then just delete it over and, and clear my cache or something, they're not going to be there. Everything stays there. Everything stays in an intermediate layer. They might not be visible in the outermost layer, but there are tools in which you can actually see how your whole Docker image was built. You can inspect the layers and folks can extract all of your sensitive information. So again, keep them out of your Docker file. There are different ways in which you can uh, keep all of the sensitive information. Um, and something that I really use a lot and that I recommend and is probably a very, very robust manner to do is multi -stage, is using multi-stage builds. Where basically you have a base image, for example, um, I, in, in, in this massive Docker file, I'm using Slim Buster, and that's my compile image. Um, so you can fetch and manage secrets there. And um, not everything always needs to be compiled. Uh, and sorry, not everything comes as well. So if you also need to compile packages, for example, if you need GCC or Jupyter for something, you can do the compile also in that first layer and then carry it over for the second layer. Um, and also using this approach gives you uh, a much smaller images overall. So again, I'm going to just go over how you would do, for example, you have this Docker file and you would use the same command Docker build. Um, you specify your Docker file well, the, and the context and you provide a name and a tag. So it's going to start first by creating this Docker image that is compiled image. And in this particular example, I am using um, um, I am compiling some packages, sorry. I'm providing options for my compiler and installing some requirements. Then in the second image, that is the actual runtime image, that is the actual one where I'm going to be doing my development work, is I carry over all of these compiled packages or pre-compiled packages and install them directly um, in a virtual environment that I'm creating. So this virtual environment is what is going to have all of my final compiled install dependencies. 
And also, if I were to have secrets in the first image, let's say special compound, uh, compile flags or a special um, access flags, those are not passed over to the runtime image. So that also makes it much, much more secure for me and whoever is using it. So my final image has that tag, has that name that I provided as part of, um, sorry, as part of my Docker run command. And it contains everything that I need, but it tends to be much, much smaller. I don't need to carry over GCC and GFortran, uh, which is now unnecessary. And I know that probably at this point, this all sounds like a lot because it is a lot. And, and it, it can be very, very overwhelming, especially when you are not an experienced Docker user or you're getting started. Uh, so my best advice is always automate. Try not to reinvent the wheel. Most of the times you don't need to build everything from scratch unless you need very, very specific uh, setups, permissions, libraries, or access levels. Um, so again, to start, if you already know what you're, uh, something that I always recommend to anyone working in data science for reproducibility, portability, um, and reusability is always know what you're expecting everywhere. So the best way for you to automate and optimize your Docker builds is also having a consistent project structure and template. I like using the cookie cutter data science and there is um, like an, an, a Docker ready version, which is cookie cutter Docker science. And it already gives you uh, a very good baseline on how your project should look like or should be built. And this makes it much easier when you're building your Docker files and mount um, and carrying over software or carrying over files because it's easier to know where things live, uh, where things are living. Sorry, um, and debug stuff. Um, unless again, as unless you have very specific requirements, uh, leverage the use of tools like Repo to Docker. Um, because it already gives you configured and optimized uh, Docker images. Uh, all the folks working in Jupyter, Binder, and Repo to Docker in general have been put a lot of work and thought there. Um, and you can install Repo to Docker through Conda. Through Conda. So do Conda install. And then um, if you already have a repository with a JAML file, uh, with an environment of JAML or requirements text. Uh, you run Jupyter repo to Docker. You don't have to create any Docker files. And it's going to create all of your Docker, well, you're going to create your Docker image ready to use. Um, and also, if you want to use something like Binder, this is the same Docker image that it would be created by Binder. So you ensure that your project is ready for usage. Um, and instead of having to, to write a massive Docker file, um, everything is done for you. And I absolutely love repo to Docker. I'm a massive fan. Um, and it works with whatever it like. The beautiful thing of repo to Docker is that it works with pretty much anything or any package specification that you're already using, whether it is an environment of JAML, a pet file, requirements. Um, if you're using Julia as well, you can use Julia specification environments, uh, install R for R users. You have a lot, a lot of, uh, you can even use uh, Next package manager specification files. And if you are already a like a Docker, um, heavy user, I need very, very specific environments. You can provide also your Docker file. Um, also, if you're using containers, Docker containers to do your dev work, uh, you probably do it daily or every time you work on a project. That's good. Um, but also make sure that your image is built frequently. If there is a Docker container that I use every day, I probably want to rebuild my Docker image um, every week 
or every other week. Because that ensures not only that all my dependencies are up to date, but also the binaries for the operating system that I'm using. And if you're using things like um, the Python 3.7 Slim Buster, you also get the latest security patches and security updates. So it also ensures that your Docker container is continuously receiving um, and being updated to the latest security patches. But you don't have to do this manually. I, if you already have a version control and are using things like Travis, GitHub Actions um, to build, well, to test and to continuous integration and continuous delivery, uh, you can delegate all of this build of, of your image to, to these tools as well. Uh, something that I do is, for example, now in GitHub Actions, uh, not only you can you create um, your image when there is a pull request or when there is a release, but you can set cron, um, you can set scheduled builds. So you can say for in this example, I have weekly on Sundays at two o'clock in the morning. I don't know. It's a totally arbitrary time, but it can be on every Monday at five o'clock uh, or every Friday at five o'clock when the week is finished. Um, and then you have the concrete tags and it can be pushed directly to whatever container registry you use, whether that's Docker Hub or um, Azure Container Registry or Google Cloud or whatever, or, or your own in-house. Um, so this makes your workflow much, much easier because you have your code and version control, whatever you're using to build your images, if it's a Docker file or report to Docker, you can have your triggers uh, on tags, your schedule triggers, build your image, push, and then you can use that. And oh, sorry, and everybody can use this um, readily from, from your container, uh, from your repository. Um, so just to summarize, and I know I am giving you a lot, lot of information, and probably at this time, you're, your brain is full of a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to give you the top tips. And these are at least the minimal uh, or the baseline requirements that you should uh, try to get into your Docker and data science workflow. First, reveal your images frequently. Make sure that you're getting the security updates for system packages. This is uh, especially important for um, avoiding vulnerabilities or problems um, with any of your images. Second, never work as root. Minimize the privileges. Uh, if, if you're building your own images, make sure that always uh, right before your entry point, as after you build all of the binaries and all of the system specifications, you are switching to a um, non-privileged user with access to whatever the working directory is. Um, don't use Alpine Linux. It's very good for a lot of stuff, but for data science and machine learning, um, it is much more trouble than it's worth. Uh, yes, it is a very small image, um, but you, you're paying the price for that for that small size. Uh, my advice, go for Buster. That's the, probably the best uh, distribution at the moment. Um, it has long-term support, use a stretch or the Jupyter stack. Uh, if you can't use the Jupyter stack, always know what you're expecting. Pin all the versions, pin everything. Um, try to use, instead of using traditional pip, and this is very opinionated, instead of just doing pip install requirements, blah, um, use pip tools for dependency rich solution or Tonda or Poetry or pipm. Choose whatever tool you prefer, stick to it, and make sure that you always know what you're expecting from your base image, um, from all your dependencies and even from your databases. Leverage build cache. Um, be very smart, separate all of your, um, your run commands based on the context. This is gonna ensure that your image doesn't get rebuilt every time there is a minimal change in your code. Um, so make sure that everything, uh, it's making the most of the, the, the building cache. 
use one Docker file per project. Sometimes uh, folks have a single uh, kitchen sink container and or Docker file, and they have all of the 70 dependencies that they need for every single project they could be working on or the company works on. Uh, it is very, 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 very troublesome to do it this way. So one project, one Docker file, one image. And use multi-stage builds. If you need to compile code, if you need to reduce your image size, if there is no way that you can use build flags or environment variables um, when you're orchestrating your code, uh, orchestrating your containers, use multi-stage builds and make your images identifiable. Um, sometimes you might need to provide different environment flags or different build flags to differentiate from test production and environment, uh, test production, test production and research and development environment. It's because sometimes you need access to different databases, you sometimes need a different ingress or different egress rules. Um, so make sure that all your images are identifiable. Uh, make sure that you are providing the right variables and do not reinvent the wheel. Use repo to Docker. Um, if none of these advanced uh, requirements apply to you or to your project, uh, use repo to Docker. It is amazing and I love it and I use it all the time. And finally, automate. Um, there is no need to build your image yourself every week and push it manually. Um, delegate as much as possible of these tasks, um, like building, tagging, and pushing to whatever, whatever platform you are using for um, your, your continuous integration or continuous delivery. Um, I demonstrated an example with GitHub Actions because it allows me to do scheduled runs or scheduled tasks, and that works for me. But choose again whatever works for you and for your team, but try don't do it manually because um, it's boring. It is it is boring, and you don't want to be rebuilding your image manually and pushing it every week. Um, and use a linter. Uh, I didn't mention this before, uh, but I I use right well my my editor of choice is VS Code. I've been using it for a very very long time, um, and there is a Docker extension, and I absolutely love it because um, it provides linting capabilities. I can write my Docker file and make sure that everything well, that I'm using the correct commands, um, that everything is written accordingly. And it also helps me with a lot of my tasks um, on my Docker development workflow. Um, so especially when you're starting to use Docker, um, I highly, highly, highly recommend using Lantern. Um, just for you to, to make sure that your syntax is correct, your construction is correct. And also if you're working with multi-stage builds, uh, sometimes it can be quite hard if you have everything in Docker file. I sometimes split them uh, in, in separate Docker files, but just generally use Linter and that will make your life so much easier um, in a similar way as, as Linter is for Python work. Um, so I hope you find these tips and the content in this presentation uh, valuable and that has convinced you a bit to, to try and optimize or improve your Docker and data science workflow. Um, as I said, I'm going to be taking some questions now. I have um, probably like five minutes or, or so and I'm also going to be later on in the Microsoft and VS Code room. Um, so you can come chat uh, with me about Docker, machine learning, VS Code, I love VS Code, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, whatever is that you, um, that you want to talk about. And thank you everyone, thank you very much. 
and I think I'm gonna be stop sharing my screen. Hey. All right. Uh, thank you for that amazing talk. Uh, it was, you know, I think all of us learned something new out of it. Uh, so. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this applause is for you and also for your dog. Uh, uh, so... Oh, my dog is the worst. <laughs> no, it was awesome. We were having fun. <laughs> so uh, we have two questions. I think you have five minutes left and we can take them right now. Uh, so the first question is uh, from Ignasi. Uh, why not use environment variables or volume mounting for sensitive information instead of increasing Docker file complexity with multi-stage builds? Uh, what not use environment variables? Um, because especially, well, it depends. If you are just setting your environment variables and then providing them through however your um, However, you're orchestrating your container, for example, if you are using uh, Azure or AWS or Kubernetes, you can provide those as you're running your container. Uh, but a lot of folks actually use them as build environment variables, and those are persisted in your final image. Um, those are the cases where you should avoid providing those directly. If you can provide them at runtime environment, that's fine. Yeah, okay, uh, I, I, I hope that solved your question. You can also type in uh, the questions if you have. We have actually time left for more questions. Uh, so the next question is from Diego. Uh, about users and mounted volumes, I wanted to share a Docker image with multiple users and contain amounts, contain amount a volume in R R RW mode. The process will set a UID a hyphen GID of the Docker user and not the host user. This potentially can lead to all sorts of errors in terms of permissions because the Docker user and the host users are different. How do you solve this issue without rebuilding the image with the right user? Oh, um, so I normally, to avoid these issues, these permission issues, um, that's why I set the non-privileged user when within the Docker file. That's the easiest way because that way you can set your UID your GUID and um, I just forgot that command. So you can create your directories and I forgot the command if someone can help me. Um, or, so you can, you can actually ensure that the permissions are Oh, you are can correct. post that on the break room later. Yeah, I'll do that later. Um, but I can provide an example of how I do it on my Docker files normally to prevent this. Um, it is very, very hard if you don't do, oh, chowning. You have to do a, a chown on a whatever directory for the relevant uh, user ID and UUID. Um, otherwise, you're always going to have problems between this Docker host and Docker users permissions. And that's normally because of the default behavior of Docker always running as root. Okay, so the next question is from Johannes. Uh, could you say something about EMB bars, build bars, and especially about DB access and what one should avoid? Uh, I think I missed that. So can you repeat my question? Oh, yeah, 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 got it. Uh, could you say something about the environment variables and build variables, especially something about database access and what one should avoid? Oh, yes. So, for example, for database, um, an example is sometimes you have um, a production database and sometimes you have another R&D database um, because that, that's how sometimes companies or a project decide to work. Um, so when you're using the command docker run, you can actually pass a build variable. Uh, uh, you can have an environment variable that takes one value when it's production and one value when it's um, R&D, for example. And when you build your Docker image, you can set those. Um, and you can imagine that almost, if it's production, your environment variable would be pointing to your production database. Um, 
um, R&D when you're in R&D. Um, this is very, very helpful because that way you ensure that folks are, are working within the domain that they need. Um, and also because uh, in many cases when you're working in an, I've seen cases where folks are working in an R&D environment and they share, for example, um, the same password or the same user for Access database. Um, and that's okay if, if, if you can't do like completely wipe out your production database. Um, but you want to be very, very careful and avoid any destructive operations when you're using your production database. And that's when setting this uh, test development and production environment variables through setting a build flag can be very, very useful. All right, that's awesome. I think we are out of time. Uh, I think we can take the rest of the questions to the break room or you can reach out uh, to Tanya later. Uh, awesome. Thank you for your talk. Thank you everyone for coming. I think we have a short coffee break after which we will be coming back to the parrot track again. Awesome. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.